What's going on, everyone? We're back from Miami. We're here to introduce you to one of my favorite, most exciting episodes we've ever recorded in the Living Will experience. Marty Collner is not only an incredible entrepreneur, he's not only one of the greatest directors, working with some of the greatest talent that we've ever seen in the history of entertainment, but he's also breaking into the NFT scene in a really major way. From drops like the Andy Warhol drop that he recently did to working with some of the most prolific artists, he is pushing the envelope of what the entertainment world can look like, and he's doing so in an entertaining and fun way. I'm extremely inspired by this man. If you can't tell, I'm very excited about this interview, and I'm so grateful for everyone who's tuning in. So if you like the podcast, please like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you think. And Marty, thank you so much for being here on the show. It's a great honor. Thank you so much for being here, everyone, and welcome back to Living With Will. And, and yeah, man, I just want to say, you know, I like to start these off on a, a wave of gratitude. I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Where are you? Right now I'm in New Mexico. I'm trying to give off the illusion of intelligence with the books behind me. Um, <laughs> but I'm back in LA next week. There won't be any books. It'll just be a white wall. <laughs> How about you? There's no intelligence here. Where are you right now? LA. Amazing. Well, yeah, I love that you're in the Lakers gear. Uh, and when I'm back, man, we got to we gotta do something. I'll be back in, uh, in the flight path of Burbank Airport here in a few days now. I'm pretty much a Lakers freak. Amazing. We need, we need more. I've been uh, for a long time. Yeah, man. No, so I, it's, you know, you, you make this transition very easy. We're here at the beginning. I like to start at the beginning of people's lives. You know, we are all kids at one point. So I'm curious, you know, how did you go from being Marty the Kid to Marty the Man Myth Legend that we all know and love in the clubhouse community and uh, in entertainment and show business across the world? Well, I started out in Cincinnati, Ohio, raised by a single mom and a tough as a kid um, because we were the only people on the street that had, you know, didn't have, that had a broken family. And, but I like to say what I, it gave me a sense of survival that's pretty much propelled me through my whole career and life. Um, I got my eye in a very strange way. I'm known for my eye, but it happened in a really strange way. Um, my parents were divorced. My father left when I was two. He never saw him. I never saw him again. He mm -hmm. died when I was 10. And my mother was really lower middle class. She had three jobs and took buses and somehow scraped together enough money to put us in a $38,000 house. And silverware didn't match because it was taken from every restaurant in the city and uh, the furniture didn't match. And on the wall were pictures from like Kmart of ships and scenic landscapes that cost maybe three or four bucks and, you know, it was pretty maudlin, but that's all I knew. So to me, it was fine. And then when my father passed away, when I was 10, he, he was very, very, very wealthy, although he never spent money. And I, I didn't really resent him for it, but the family said, you know, we got to culture this kid up. So from the time I was 10 till I was 18, I spent in Chicago and I was so poor, I would, fly out there in my baseball uniform. But when I got there, all of a sudden, I was whisked into a penthouse at the Drake Hotel with real Monets, real Chagalls, real Picassos, China, fine China, butlers, beauty, art everywhere. And I didn't, it was easy to see the difference, obviously. But I didn't realize that I was going to develop an eye. I didn't even know why I developed an eye. Hi, Lily. Sorry, dog just came in. Oh, good. Um, you can edit that out. So I didn't know why or how I was going to, why it happened. I could never understood why I had this eye. And then I figured it out. This is why, because by osmosis, the beauty went in and it went in a part of the brain that never comes out. 
So I was known for shooting women. I would make them beautiful. And I said, how come I have this talent? And that's, that's how that happened. From there, I, uh, I was pretty much a bumsky. And my mother was really worried about me, although I had done some acting in high school and college. She was worried about me and she said, uh, you know, would you consider, she was the office manager at TV Guide magazine. And she said, would you consider a job? Hold on one second. Can you close the door, please? Or shut up? <laughs> so uh, I'm on earbuds. So, you know, everything they talk about you hear mm-hmm. goes to the mic. So, <clears throat> So she said, you know, how about a job in television? I said, ah, okay, what the hell? And I got a job. I went down to Channel 9 in Cincinnati, and I got this job as a prop man. Well, to cut the story short, seven weeks later, I was directing. This is where I was supposed to be. And they couldn't get me out. And the first day I was there, there was a plane crash, and the action, and the lights, and the applause, and the Nick Clooney show, and George Clooney's father just sucked me right in and they couldn't get me out. I was there like, I slept like two hours a day and if I could sleep there, I would have. So I became this, I became a director in seven weeks and I rose to be like the top director in the city. But you know, being a top director in Cincinnati is like being a top top director in Rhode Island. You know, it's not that big a deal. But there was a lot of live television there and, and, uh, and I went in I wanted to make 200 bucks a week. I started out at $89 a week and I wanted to make 10,000 a year. That was my benchmark of success. And I went into the general manager's office. He had a picture of J. Edgar Hoover and Barry Goldwater on the wall and his desk set up for me he had a gun. He was about as right wing as you could get. And I'm just the total opposite. So he would say to me, he would say, I went in, he said, I heard you want a raise. I said, yeah, well, I'm the best director in the city. I deserve a raise. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, I'm not going to give you a raise. And I said, why not? He says, your hair is too long. Your beard's too long. You don't follow the rules. I see you without your jacket and your tie, blah, blah, blah. And I basically said, okay, I quit. And I didn't know what I was going to do but there was a broadcasting magazine in his outer office. On the way out, I picked up and I saw an ad for a director in Cleveland, Ohio for 13,500 a year, was making national commercials and doing local television shows. This is where I learned lighting because lighting is next to God. But Mm -hmm. so I got the job and I was in Cleveland, but being in Cleveland likes being in hell. So I was there for like a year and then a call, a friend of mine who worked with me in Cincinnati was in BC in Boston. And he said, the Boston Celtics need a TV director and our station has it. I told them about you, do you want to try for it? I couldn't drive fast enough, okay? Good friend. Uh, Oh yeah, and I later encouraged him to become a Hollywood director and it worked out. But I put my pedal to the metal and I got it to Boston. I got the job, 14000 a year. I was thrilled. I was happy, married, had a kid. Everything was good. You know, thank God that's not my wife anymore. But at the time, I was obviously too young. You know, that's why I have a rule. No kids get married before they're 30. And, um, and I started doing some freelancing of basketball games. I developed the name. And then in 19, in the mid seventies, in the late seventies, I had two offers. One was from NBC Sports for pretty big money. And I was gonna be the director, they groomed me for the World Series, the Super Bowl, Olympics, the NBA championships, the hockey, everything, which was a really attractive job. Mm-hmm. And there was this other little company that said, well, we'll give you a third of that, but you can be responsible for a new network. You can be responsible for the look of the network. You can be responsible for the sound of the network. You can do all of our specials, which are non-sports, and you can be a big fish in a little pond. And I took that. And the name of that company was HBO. 
and there were seven of us. I was there for, you know, about eight or nine years, or about seven, I guess eight years, and I really had a big name at this point. I was doing all their big specials, and, you know, and then I was laying in bed one day. I moved to LA. I told me you're starting an LA office, too cold for me in New York, and I had a lot of power then. So then I, I was in, I'm now married to my second wife, and I was in LA, and I was in, laying in bed one day, and this thing called the Z Channel had this music video come on called Betty Davis Eyes by Kim Carnes, directed by an Australian named Russell Mackay. Looked at it, and I said, uh, this is unbelievable. They're breaking every rule. They're crossing the line, what you don't do in film, they're jump cutting, and yet it's working, okay? And I'm entertained and I'm blown away. I have to go do this. So I turned to my wife, I'm in a seven figure a year job and I'm in a big house. And I said, I have to go do this. We could lose the house, we could lose everything. We're probably gonna be broke for a while. What do you think? She says, go for it. That's why I'm still married to her. And okay. among other many, million other things. But right. I said, she said, go for it. So I flew to New York and I had a uh, meeting with a guy named Ahmed Erdogan who signed Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones. Didn't know much what music videos were. Hi, Marty, how you doing? I like your work, blah, blah, blah. Thank you, thank you. I want to do a music video. He said, okay, I got three bands, pick one. One was an Australian band named In Excess. Another one was uh, a band from New Orleans called Zebra. And he had this bar band he didn't know what to do with. Thank you. He had this bar band he didn't know what to do with. And he said, I'm going to maybe drop these guys, you know, I, unless you can come up with some genius idea to save them. And they were called Twisted Sister. So I did this video. My first video was, we're not going to take it. And because I was a storyteller and I had a sports and a, a, a music and comedy background, sports and long gone. And I took them because I thought they were funny. And I thought they were had a good anthem. And we're not going to take it, which is not the song the record company wanted to release. But I convinced them to make that the song. And then for the next 12 or 13 years, I had no manager, <clears throat> no agent. Of course, I have all that now, but all I had was MTV. And the phone never stopped ringing. And I would make one iconic video after another. I won't go through how I got there. There was also hard work and preparation. And so I became like MTV, kind of came like Marty TV a little bit. And uh, at the same time, I created a show that I sold to HBO called Hard Knocks, which is about football, which is the longest running sports show on television. And then I had a censorship issue with MTV. And coincidentally, the guy from HBO who wouldn't speak to me because I left so abruptly said, I have a problem with an artist. I need you to help me with. Who's the artist? He said, Madonna. And this is when Madonna was Madonna. So I went to Australia, did the girly show. And then I just kept doing specials for them. Big ones, big ones. Garth Brooks in Central Park, Rolling Stones, Mark Anthony, Justin Timberlake, Britney Spears, Bette Midler, it goes on and on. And, uh, and now I'm doing a uh, series for Netflix called The Hall. I started the Stand Up Comedy Hall of Fame and the hall's being built in New York. So what happened to me and how I got this legend moniker, which follows me around, because I don't feel like a legend, trust me. But, I, but that's what I'm pretty much called, was that I intentionally tried not to get famous. Because I came from a broken family, I wanted to go home every night to my family. So instead of going out to dinner with Justin or George Carlin or Chris Rock or Madonna or Whitney Houston or any of those people, I would always go home. 
And, you know, because you go out to dinner with them, the paparazzi and, you know, and you court fame and you can get fame if you want it. It's work, but it, it just wasn't for me because I wanted my children, my wife. I, that was for me. That's, that's what I really craved. And I said, you know, I just think someday I'll be known for a body of work. And that's what happened. That's my and, story. And what a story to have. I mean, the the list of credits that you have, it's uh, there's a reason you're called a legend. And so, you know, my first series of questions and a million more have spawned since you started talking, but I'm going to try and stick to the ones that came in with. My first would be, you know, a lot of young artists, young musicians, young talent are going to listen to this interview um, and kind of seek the knowledge that you have in some way. What would your first kind of words of wisdom be to someone starting any artistic journey? Okay, there's a couple things. Number one, anytime you get the opportunity, I don't care if it's a high school play or on stage for 10 people or on stage for 100,000 people, anytime you get the opportunity, you have to make it count because you don't know who's watching. And you cannot lose any second of being the best that you can be. And how you get that way is preparation, preparation, preparation. And the more you're prepared, the more second nature will become. And, and you know, you want to work, got to keep working if you can. But when you get that kernel, everybody gets some opportunity somewhere. There are no small opportunities because that could be the day that the head of casting at Fox happens to be in the audience with his wife. You don't know. That's how I, I found Pee Wee Herman. He was at the Groundlings. Nobody knew who he was. And he took advantage of the opportunity. He knew I was in the audience and the rest is history. So that's my advice is when you get a chance, it's rare in the beginning, just go for it. Make it count. Do not settle. Make sure you're happy and the way and preparation, preparation. To this day, I'm known as a director who does more preparation than anybody. When I did Robin Williams live on Broadway, I saw him 60 times before I shot it. And that's just the way I work. So that's that's my advice, seriously. If no, and it's a yeah, that's that's phenomenal advice. I was gonna say for anybody who wants to make it, please run that back because I'll be listening to this many times. Um, just to remind myself, show up, be prepared. And, you know, you referenced one of the greats to ever do it, the greatest by a lot of people's standards, which is Robin Williams. And, you know, the, the list of comedians that you've worked with, um, some would argue are the, all the best. So I would ask you this, you know, from a comedic standpoint, um, what's something that you've noticed in all these amazing titans of industry that you've interacted with, maybe like a common thread that they all seem to have? Well, they're different for each genre. Uh, the great stand-up comedians love to do stand-up. And when I would be out on the road with Chris Rock or Robin or Dane Cook or any of these people, Carlin, they do, let's say they were doing a show that night, okay, for like 8,000 people. They do the show. And then at two o'clock in the morning, they find some comedy club to go up and work out their material. And they never stop working. And what looked like, Robin Williams looked like improv, but it was all planned. Yes, sometimes he went off, but he always had the plan to jump back to. Mm -hmm. So it allowed him the, the space to be, to improvise, because he always knew that he had a plan to go to, which is the way I work. I, I prepare shot sheets and storyboards and everything. And then if something happens that I don't expect, I like to call happy accidents, you know, I capture that and make that happen. And then I go back to the plan and hope for some more happy accidents because that's the magic. And it's all about the magic. Okay. And that's what I try to do is to make each one magical. And the other thing I, I strongly advise is take risks. If you look at my work, every one of them is risky. Everything I did was risky. You know, I did Mark Anthony in Madison Square Garden Lime. I did a nine minute shot, with no cuts. And if it messed up, I don't know what I can say here, but if it, if it messed up. You can say whatever up, you want. Okay, <laughs> fucked up, 
And, <laughs> you know, it would have ruined it because all the cameras would have seen this game. It would have been a, but I always go for it, you know, and uh, I always take risks, take risks. And the more you prepare, the more risks you can take. And it's, uh, you know, I like to, I like to live right on the edge, but it's not luck. It's really hard work to get there. Really hard uh, work. Agreed. And I, you know, it leads me into another question, which is, you know, you're known for being one of the great directors of our, of our generation um, of, of all time. Right. So I'm curious, like from a directing standpoint, and you spoke about the importance of lighting. I want to shout out Charlie Cole, a cinematographer who actually introduced to me the importance of lighting. Um, what would, what would be kind of your advice to like a, a director or someone who's dealing with kind of behind the camera work? What would your advice be to them? Well, it's funny because I changed when I, when I first started directing, I, in order to get jobs, I made everything beautiful. So I would hire the best lighting designers. I didn't know anything about lighting. I learned from them. And everything was beautiful, and I keep getting hired. But along the way, I realized that form follows content. And that I'm at the point in my life now that if I have a beautiful shot, and it's going over a crane, going over a, a building, into a room, through the window, and it's amazing, and I have like a mediocre shot with a great performance, that's the one I'm gonna choose. So I think you always have to be about the inside rather than the outside. Lighting is next to God because you also want people to be visually stimulated, but it's not enough. It's really not enough. And it happened to me, I saw this movie called The Mission. It was the most beautiful movie I've ever seen and the most boring movie I ever saw. Hmm. And that's when I had the realization that making things beautiful is, you know, there's a lot of beautiful things out there. Now, I, I still do because it's ingrained in me, but I'm all about the content, all about it. I don't care about the shots. No question. And I, you're, you're making this so tremendously easy for me. As far as the content, I want to talk about Hard Knocks for a second. You know, you have a show that basically runs off of vulnerability and openness of industries that value secrecy so much. I'm curious how you were able to kind of get that show made. Like how, how did that happen? It wasn't easy. <laughs> um, I, you know, this Jewish hippie had to convince like, I guess 28 or 30 NFL owners that I had an idea that was good for their game. Trying to break the shield it's like impossible. So I finally found someone in the NFL office who would listen to me, a guy named John Collins. He said, it sounds like an interesting idea. And he said, but I need a broadcast partner. So if you can get like an HBO, we'll consider it. So I went to HBO and they said, they laughed at me. They said, yeah, it's great, but you'll never get the NFL. I don't do anything. So I told HBO I had the NFL. I told the NFL I had HBO. I didn't have either of them. And then I went out to the owners' meetings and tried to convince them. And I mean, this show is a very deep show on a lot of levels. It's, and I'll get to that in a minute. But Brian Billick, who was the coach of the Baltimore Ravens, was a former PR guy. And he said, I'll do it. And then Jerry Jones from the Dallas Cowboys said, I'll do it. And we took Billick and they had just won the Super Bowl the night before. I mean, the year before. And so it took off. Okay. Hard knocks is about when the coach knocks on your door and says, head coach wants to see you in your playbook, or in this case, your iPad. Now you have to understand that all of these guys were stars in junior high school, high school, and college. We're in a place now where 71 guys are fighting for 52 jobs in six weeks. The difference between making it and not making it is razor thin. The consequences are gigantic. And now they're on a stage where everybody's as big and as fast as they are. So I have a lot of friends in the NFL, who all the successful ones all tell me the same thing. They say it's mental. And so that's, that's what a hard knock is. All right, yes, there's also the football metaphor of banging and doing that. 
And we were lucky enough to have Liv Schreiber be the narrator and the storyteller. And he kind of weaves the story, you know, John Jones got here from, from University of Kentucky and his family. And, and also there are families who have sacrificed for all these years, want the payoff. Right. So they have the added pressure of buying mom a house, which is part of their goal. And they, uh, you know, it's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking when somebody's dream is crushed. And it's only in six weeks. It was really the first reality show, but it was real reality. Mm -hmm. It wasn't manufactured reality like the Kardashians. Or, not that those aren't tremendously successful, but they're just soap operas that are right. being, this is real. And uh, so much so that the NFL now has a hard knocks rule. It used to be that um, we always had problems, worries about getting teams over their concerns for privacy as you pointed out in the question, but the, uh, the league made a rule that they could compel teams to do it if necessary because their need for privacy was unequaled by the need for the promotion that this was. And it brought women into the game. They saw these people without their hardware on, they could relate to them. They could sit with their husband on a Sunday and say, oh yeah, Gianni Bernard for since that, he slept in his mom's car. So now, and their ratings went flying high. It's just a, it's just a perfect storm of things that happen. No, and I, I'm really grateful for it. And, you know, it kind of plays into a question I was going to ask you as well, which is there is like an activist element to it of, you know, storytelling and, you know, great art, I think, creates great change. Um, and you, you kind of said this at the beginning of the interview, you know, you were working for this right wing guy, but you were the total opposite. When did activism and kind of, you know, social justice start playing a part in what you do? From the beginning. Okay. I remember when I was at Channel 9 in Cincinnati, there was the Kent State shootings. This is before your time, but they killed some students at Kent State. And the adjutant general, this guy, Del Corso, who, who ordered the firings, came in to do an interview in our, at our station, a, a news interview. And I put him on risers about 12 feet in the air and dropped the camera all the way to the floor and shot up at him so he looked like the monster he was. Mm. And I got busted for it, of course. And I just, oh, I just thought that was a good angle, you know. But that's what I was doing from the beginning. And I was part of the women's movement in the 70s. And I, I, it's not a single mom, man. So I'm, I've always, I've always been, and my family, my immediate family, my son, and my, so especially my son, Jazz, we are really political activists on the left side. You know, commercials for John Kerry, and, you know, we work. I don't, want to I don't want to get into a political thing, but I was scared out of my mind and I actually considered leaving the country if Trump got reelected because I thought he was going to be trying to be a dictator. Okay. And, you know, I love Bernie and I love Joe and uh, you know, uh, Obama I was in love with, but you know, all politicians have their flaws. Mm -hmm. but, I'm not down to the right wing stuff. I've been involved. I, I, I was at the PMRC hearings on rock lyrics. And, you know, I, I, I thought congressmen would be smart. I couldn't believe how dumb these fuckers were. And I mean, they judged, we're not going to take it. This is the most violent video of all time. There was no blood. Nobody got killed. It was based on Roadrunner cartoons. So the hypocrisy and the lack of real knowledge in the witch hunt over conservative values, I thought was ridiculous. And as it turned out, it backfired on them because they stickered the albums and every kid wanted the ones. Were exactly. Yep. That's what kids are, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, but you, if we can't have it, we want it. Who are you to tell us what we can listen to? So it backfired on them. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things I appreciated so much about when I heard you speaking on Clubhouse was, you know, you spoke with passion about these issues and, I think it is a hundred, it's like paramount to everything that I do that, you know, I try to have as much fun and be as creative as I can, but maintaining that, you know, there are people who 
are suffering in the world and we need to be a part of that problem solving. So well, I like that about Clubhouse. You know, I think that 90% of the people there want to help Agreed. Want to solve problems. And I know that any drops we do, we're going to give back to charity with whoever in the drop. If, if it's my drop, it's going to be single moms. But, you know, and not only are we going to give back to charity, we're going to make sure that it goes to the people Thank that you. it's supposed to go to, not some yes. bureaucrat riding around in a limo with a $300,000 a year job. So that's part of it. Uh, giving is one thing, but making sure it gets there. And I think if you really give, you give anonymously, you know, and, you know, when you see somebody's name on the building, you know, that they're not really real. Okay, and they're doing it to get acknowledged for their philanthropy. So I mean, I'm glad they're doing it, but it's not. You know, Performative it's like, activism, it's not incredible, but I'll take it. <laughs> if you're going to help, <laughs> thank you. But uh, maybe you reconsider, you know, showing off being part of solutions. <laughs> Well, listen, I really appreciate, you know, I like to start the first half of the interviews on a more, you know, serious, deep thought kind of lens, but I like to take it a little more eccentric route, um, have a little bit more fun in the second half of the interview. So my first question to you would be this. If you were to be a superhero that was written currently, like a Stan Lee character, or Marvel, et cetera, what superhero do you think you would want to be? This is almost currently. It can be even past. Yeah. I, I want to be Superman. Yep. <laughs> I love it. Through a speeding bullet. <laughs> Stronger than a locomotive. <laughs> I love it. I'm glad. You know, it's one of the answers I thought I would hear more, but surprisingly few people uh, lean towards Superman. I always, I loved it. I loved that he was Superman and Clark Kent. He knew how to take the cape off. You know, he left it. At when I was a kid, that was a point in television for me, you know, and uh, you know, Chief White and Jimmy Olsen and all those people and Lois Lane. And we all knew that he didn't look that different, but the illusion was, is that he was in disguise. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, he duck into a phone booth, come out as Superman. And always for good though. Yeah, you gotta love it. You gotta love it. And so the next part of that question would be, now the power is in your hands. If you were a superhero that you created, what would your superpowers be? And what would your superhero name be? Well, I'd like to end hunger. Um, I'd like to end ethnic cleansing. I'd like to end racism. I'd like to end homophobia. I'd like to end uh, fear of immigrants. You know, I mean, this country is built on immigrants. Pretty much everything Trump stood for is what I try to change. Okay. Right on, dude. Fuck I'd yeah. I'd like to do everything I can to change the climate back to what it's supposed to be. And we're going to actually try and offset our carbon footprint when we mint stuff. Um, and, you know, there's a lot wrong in the world today. And I guess there always was, but it seems magnified now because the internet's made the world a small place. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes I'm on Clubhouse with Dan Cook helping people, and I'm talking to people in India and Taiwan, and, you know. But but what you find, and I found this when I did Chris Rock when I shot him in Africa and London and New York, the same jokes were landing every place. Mm -hmm. Desperate housewife jokes were landing in South Africa. Because the world is smaller. Yeah. And so. I, I love that answer. You know what? I also, and this is a bit selfish, but the reason I partly love it is because I gave the same answer when someone asked me. I think solving social issues and like fixing the world, that's not like the best superpower. Um, maybe not the flashiest. We can't do it, actually, really do it. We can just do our part. And every little bit helps. And, you know, I drive a Tesla, you know, so, I mean, it, uh, you know, we're a big believer in, in my family in clean energy. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, there's so many pollution. I mean, there's so many things that are wrong. 
I don't know how it's going to get fixed. I fear for the planet. I fear for my kids and I fear for my grandkids. And, I do as well. You know, I want them to have the kind of magic life that I've had. So, you know, that's one of the reasons I was so scared that Trump would get reelected. Because I knew it was over. Yeah. It would be a dictator and this would have become Iraq or Iran. Yeah, we don't need four years of that um, no, ever not, again. No, we do not need it. It was, uh, and he almost pulled it off. Yeah, no, I would have, it would have, the, uh, dealing with the burden of the damage that he's dealt in four years is, is daunting enough, but dealing with it in eight, um, Angela Davis had a, had a quote about that. She, I want to say she said this in the seventies and I'm paraphrasing, but it was, if, and if the last four years are, are any indication of where the next four years are going, uh, we are facing fascism, you know, and we need to, and she said that in the seventies, right? So yeah. But, you know, for, fortunately, the American people spoke. And I think, you know, and when I'll I, see. I, not only did the American speak, uh, uh, public speak, which is, of course, necessary because of all the gerrymandering and the mm -hmm. suppression of voters' rights, but the court spoke. Yeah. The court spoke on Trump appointees. Yeah. So it, you know, it gave me hope. Same. And even the Supreme Court that he packed ruled against him. It gave me hope of some goodness. You know, I love what Joe's doing. We're all going to be back in like April or May. Amazing. And, you know, it's amazing. And so, it, you know, Wayne was going before. You know, he's got a lot of blood on his hands. There's a lot of people that did not need to die. Agreed. Agreed. And I'll share this with you as well. You know, first of all, uh, today is the celebration of my second vaccine. So you're, you're uh, having a, yeah, this is a monumental moment for me a year in, you know, and we're, we're almost, we're getting out of the darkness, you know, as a community. And I want to say, you know, take this moment to anyone who's suffered from COVID that, you know, or that anyone in the audience knows my heart is with you and your family. And, uh, hmm? did you get it? No, fortunately I didn't. I, I was, I felt sick, but I honestly believe that the sickness I was feeling was like the sickness of the world. Like, I think there was an anxiety that we could all feel um, because there was so much pain across the globe. But fortunately, no, I, I, I was lucky to, to not have to deal with it. Um, what a time. I mean, what, it's, it's terrifying, but I'll share this optimism with you. Part of the reason I think that we're going to make it is because the horrible people who are ignoring these issues, like willfully choosing to ignore uh, systems of oppression and systems of harm and climate change denial, um, eventually they're going to know if I keep ignoring this, I will die too. And I think that realization, I mean, it's, it's like performative activism, right? Whatever gets you there. If it's, if it's self-preservation, I don't care. Just, we got to help the world. I agree. So that gives me optimism. I think we, turned a, I think we did turn a big corner uh, with the election. You know, he's 78 years old. He doesn't give a shit. He wants to do well. He's not, doesn't have a political agenda. He really wants to help. Yeah. Oh, you know, and you know, I heard today or yesterday that he's forgiving all these student loans and that, you know, and uh, I mean, what this, what they, I'm not going to even go through the list of the abhorrent things that that. Well, yeah. yeah. I think we all know. Yeah, and I think that we're we're beginning to do a decent job of holding it accountable. I think we could be a little bit more like up in arms, but I, I understand why I think, uh, this trial in Minneapolis is really important. Yep. I was, thank you. Please speak on it. Yeah, I agree. Because if this cop gets off, America is going to burn to the ground. I agree. I was just saying that today. I fear that he, that he might, but, um, I, I would believe that, you know, being that the police chief is being has spoken out against him, um, colleagues of his have spoken out. I think there is some systemic reform that needs to happen, and I think the system is more open than it's ever. I mean, I don't know how it's taken so long. If I'm being totally honest, how how is it that black life is still not valued in this country? But I think this is a step in the right direction. Forever, what happens is is that children mirror their parents. They're not born racist. Agreed. They are taught it. Mm -hmm. So as long as that's going on, your generation has to change it. Okay. My generation fucked it up, but your generation has to change it. And, you know, 
anybody uses the N word in the house or anyone uh, treats anybody differently because of their sexual or uh, racial preferences, you know, that's going to go down to the children, whether it's whether it's subtle or it's 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 overt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's going to be up to your generation to set better examples than mine did. Agreed. And I, and to your point, I think it all starts, it's an interpersonal journey. You know, first people need to work on themselves, uh, recognize how you are, you know, contributing to these issues. Uh, and then, you know, reach out to your family, reach out to your friends and, and be an active part of change. You know, it's like that the, you know, those who are silent in the face of oppression are themselves oppressors. So our to anyone family, listening, don't be an oppressor. <laughs> what was that? Our family split over this election, we split the family. Okay, now we still love them in our family. Yeah. It, 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 okay, because, you know, a lot of them looked at him, he, it as more money. Yeah. And, yep. Uh, that trumped everything for them, pardon the pun. But, uh, and, then, and the pandemic split the family too, because some were reckless and some were safe. Mm -hmm. All the reckless ones got COVID. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's really unfortunate how this pandemic has showed the lack of care for others. You know, uh, a lot of people didn't understand you're not wearing a mask for you, like you're wearing it for everyone around you. Um, and I and I lost a lot of friends over that those arguments. You know, the lack of understanding. Me too. You know, yeah. You know, when the leaders put masks down, you know, gives them an excuse, and you know the racism and the anti-Semitism. A little bit like Nazi Germany. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that was the playbook, by the way. And so, you saying, yeah. And so, anyway, I don't, I don't want to develop into a political discussion because it's kind of boring, but that's the way I feel. And I appreciate it. And listen, to your point, I, I, when I was working for the Senate, I spoke with Holocaust survivors who said that this, that administration, our most recent, reminded them of what they saw in Germany. So it's not just a theory that that Marty is exhibiting. For the Senate? Uh, yeah, I was working for a senator in California named Ben Allen. Shout out to him in his office. Um, yeah. the, say that one more time. Democrat? Yes, of, co of course. Of course. Yeah. Of course. I wanted to learn how government works. You know, I was an ethnic studies, gender studies major. So social justice is at the cornerstone of everything I do. But I didn't understand how government worked. So I got the opportunity, um, like took the shot, like we spoke on, got a chance to work in an office and learn how they, how it worked. And then saw that I had to go and use my own voice. So yeah. here we are now. It's a real loss of innocence when you see how it works. Discouraging. And in, especially because we don't teach government or financial literacy. That was one of the main things. I didn't realize how many resources we have at our disposal and how important local and state elections are, you know? Speaking of one, shout out to Isaac Bryan and his special election May 18th. It, it, for anyone in California listening, super progressive candidate. For anyone who leans the left, like Marty and I, please check out Isaac Bryan. And Marty, I want to let you get on. I know you're you have a, a busy day and you're a busy man. And I, I appreciate the time I've had. Let me set this last. I'm gonna set the scene for you with this last question. But before I do it, my second to last question is two part. The first one being, if you had to eat three regional foods, three cuisines, I think. Culinary art is an underrepresented art form. So I like to close out my interviews, raising awareness to the, the language we all speak, the universal language of food. What three regions would you rock? If you were on like a desert island and could only access three cuisines, what would they be? Well, I'm vegan. So purely vegan. Well, I'm naturally now I'm a pescatarian because my doctor recommended that I eat fish. So mm. I eat fish, but that's it. No animals of any kind. I can't even kill a cockroach. No cows, no chickens, no lambs, no dairy, no milk, no cheese. For life, or is this new? 27 years. For life. Amazing. For life. And, and I was the biggest carnivore you ever met in your life. And it started out, there's this actress named Alicia Silverstone who got me into it. And it started out, I did it for like health reasons. Mm. I read a book that convinced me I could reverse any damage I had uh, 
caused by my hedonistic lifestyle. But about halfway down the chute, it started to become a moral thing. Mm. Okay. And my son was a vegan. He wouldn't even wear leather. So, you know, it, so I would actually say some sort of plant-based based, uh, food. Love it. And there's, and there's plant-based alternatives for everything you can think of. Yeah. And when I started, there wasn't. So for the first year, I just ate pasta and lost 35 pounds. So that should tell you how much garbage is in the meat. Yeah. And, and, you know, and everybody's eating that garbage. I think that's, and not only that, the cows are causing climate change with the water. So yep. it, uh, you know, obviously um, I would like, uh, I like fish. So that would be, I don't know where it would be from anywhere. Cool. Uh, and the other than that, be all plant-based uh, fruits, vegetables. And it's funny how your palate changes and you start to, re I said to myself, there's no way that meat can be served to me that I haven't had 10,000 times. So this is a whole new journey. Yeah. And I got new tastes and, you know, things I thought I would never eat. I loved. I'm starting this journey in the plant-based direction and uh, I'm struggling right now with kind of making sure that I'm eating all the nutrients that I need and getting all the protein. But I, I'm a, it's a testament to, I feel much better. I mean, one day. All yeah. It, it's all it took. It's like, and I'm working with people because I, I made a commitment to pay it back, mm. pay it forward, I should say. Right. Try and help as many people as I can. And what I try to do is introduce them to a lifestyle of which they really don't sacrifice any of the things that they loved. Totally. So diet. And, you know, there's alternatives for meat and cheese, and, and they're really good. I eat vegan bacon all the time. Yeah. Okay. Those vegan deli slices are good too. I don't know if you've had those ones. Yeah, Super good. A little lot of salt in them, but yes, <laughs> they're, they're good. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I also don't need sugar. So, I mean, I'm like crazy. That's and, impressive. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm there yet. You'll get there. You're young. Working on it. Well, listen, I want to let you get on. Uh, I got one last one for you. I'm going to set the scene for you. Um, but I want to say thank you first before I do. I, I'm so grateful. It's been an amazing conversation. My pleasure. So this is the scene. It's 33 years from now, 33 years, 33 days. We're on a private island. Your private island's connected to mine by a sky bridge. Uh, we minted this for trillions. It's, it's projecting out in the ocean. There's an absolute rager. All the NFT communities there, everyone's losing their shit. And uh, it's getting to the end of the, uh, the end of the interviews coming. Everyone's kind of hushing each other up. Oh, shit. It's Marty's final thoughts. And that, and this is it, you know, this is the question. What would your final thoughts to the audience be, whether it's words of wisdom or uh, anything that you want to impart? What would you, what would you say? Get ready to go to Mars. <laughs> I love it. I'm just worried that the uh, planet's going to blow itself up. And, you know, I think space and Elon Musk, I'm not saying we're going to Mars, but I, there has to be a reckoning. I mean, you know, Spain didn't want to spend explorers and they didn't send explorers there would be no America. Yeah. So I just think that, you know, my final words of wisdom is each person try to do their bit, try to not fuck up the planet because once climate change hits, this pandemic will look like Mary Poppins. All plagues end. Okay? But, they won't, but the earth has been wiped out five or six times. The dinosaurs were wiped out and the earth has a way of resetting itself. I don't know how much of it's man-made or how much, how much of it's evolution, but just in case, you know, and, and you know, water is going to be a big problem. And I, the other thing is help somebody. Okay, help somebody. You can help them with words. You can help them with money. You can help them with support. But you'd be surprised. I was surprised when I got on Clubhouse and I was talking and how my words, and I know it because of the DMs I got, were really helping people. This is stuff that I took for granted. I didn't realize that everybody didn't feel the same way I did. You know, I had this one saying that took on more, I got more uh, reaction to this than anything. I said, you know, a man who doesn't build castles in the air 
doesn't build them anywhere. And I got that from my mom and it's encouraging people to dream big. That's the biggest reaction I got from people in the club. I can't believe you said that. Oh my God, this is what I never need to do. People writing it down, posting what they wrote down and, you know, do good. Just do good, you know, giving is much more rewarding than receiving. I'm so grateful, Marty. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute honor. Thank you.